Okay, thank you for being so patient, everyone. I'm Katie Kulas, CEO of Yellow Ladybugs. And in the spirit of reconciliation, Yellow Ladybugs acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. Welcome to this panel discussion dedicated to supporting gender diverse autistic students. The content is designed with a specific focus on understanding gender diversity and why it's vital to support gen gender diversity and gender expression for our autistic young people in the school environment. Before going any further, I have a short note that I wanted to talk about in terms of the content one morning. While our aim is to have a discussion that is accessible for autistic teens and young people, parental discretion is recommended and parents, carers in our audience may prefer to watch this panel before deciding whether it's appropriate for their tweens or teens in their care. Topics for discussion may include references to sexual violence and abuse, references to poor mental health, self-harm and suicidal ideation, discussions about different gender identities and expressions of sexuality and queer culture. So thank you so much for joining us today. One of the most important protective factors when it comes to supporting our young people is showing up and you're doing that today. So thank you. We need to ask questions, make it clear that we want to learn more, that our young people are seen and valued and heard. It's always really exciting to bring a live audience together with our panelists who have such a wealth of lived experience, knowledge and expertise to share with us. And also, of course, a big welcome to all our parents and carers, teachers, allied health professionals who are looking to support gender diverse autistic students today. If you're in there watching today in the chat, share how you're supporting young people today, what your background is, we'd love to hear from you. Without a question, the content is relevant to all students, teachers and carers in supporting a welcome and supporting environment where students can be themselves. And to all our neurokin who are tuning in today, the warmest of welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you to the Department of Education and Training Victoria for sponsoring this event, which has allowed us to deliver this important and empowering content for free for all of you today. Yellow Ladybugs has long been advocating for how important it is that autistic youth, and especially girls and gender diverse autistic young people, have access to appropriately tailored information about a range of topics, including sexuality, gender diversity, and education around consent and healthy relationships. And we are delivering that. We've previously done panels on this, and today we've got some incredible lineups. Today's discussion, we hope to provide parents and carers and our young people some guidance about how, how to best support the intersectional needs of autistic students that also identify as gender diverse. And it is about the protective measures we can take to address their vulnerabilities that comes with this intersection and the positive steps we can take to empower young people. We, but we really must continue to educate ourselves. We must foster a culture of openness and continue to learn from lived experience of our young people and our wider community. And we strongly believe that we owe it to our young people to have direct and honest dialogue on these topics. And what better way to do this than today through the wonderful mix of lived experience and professional experience. Which brings me to our introductions for our two panelists today. We have had a change in lineup as with our live events, that's what happens. And to support our neurodivergent community, we 100% support uh, making changes where needed. And we're here today, um, to get guidance from our current and future generations of autistic gender diverse people and navigating this world. So let me um, also note, and it is a mouthful and I'm sorry there's so much to share, but um, I do, well, before I get into the introductions, please note that with language around autistic identity and LGBTQIA plus identity, we always defer to the lived experience of the panel speakers themselves. And although we appreciate and acknowledge that terminology can change and that each individual family may have their own preference regarding terminology, this is our approach. So let's start with the panelists. We've got Shadia Hancock today joining us. 
Um, their pronouns are they, their theirs. And Shadia is a proud owner and founder of Autism Actually and ambassador for Yellow Ladybugs. They are currently studying a Bachelor of Speech Pathology with the long-term goal of specialising in AAC, Autism Language Development and Animal Assisted Therapy. Welcome, Shadia. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Katie. It's great to be here. <laughs> Thank you. And thanks for joining last minute. We really appreciate it. We've also got Shazzy, Sabi, they, them. Shazzy is a therapist with over 20 years experience. They are active advocate for the neurodivergent LGBTQIA plus community, mental health and disability rights. Shazzy is focused on centering marginalized and silenced voices through an intersectional lens. We are so excited to have you here today, Shazzy. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Amazing. So welcome all. We are going to spend a large part of this hour long panel with a discussion between our panelists on topics that are central to this conversation. And towards the end of the hour, we have allocated some time to respond to audience questions that might pop up during the course of our live session. So please remember that you're welcome to share your questions and comments along the way via the chat function. And as a host, I will try and facilitate this Q&A as best I can. So what I'm going to quickly do is a little intro um, for you on these slides because we just need to make sure that we're all across some of the terminology that you might hear in this discussion. And of course, some of you may be across this language, some of you might be new, so please keep that in mind. Today's topic on gender diversity, um, there's a really great resource that you will get a link to in terms of all our resources. But the genderbred person is a really easy way to understand um, the concept of gender diversity. And the first term you might hear is gender identity today. And that's where your psychological sense of self, um, it's who you in your head know yourself to be based on how much you align or don't align with what you understand to be the option for gender. Gender expression you might hear today, and that's the way you present gender through your actions, clothing, demeanor, and many, many more ways. And it's your outward facing self and how that's interpreted by others based on gender norms. There's also a term that you might hear called gender non-conforming, and it's the people who do not follow other people's ideas or society stereotypes about how they should look, act based on the female or male sex they were assigned at birth. And I know there's a lot of terms, but I'm trying to get through them quickly because I want to jump to our speaker. The last term is gender diversity and gender diverse. And that can be used by people who identify with gender or genders outside of the binary of male or female. And gender diversity refers to a range of gender expressions and identities. And this term includes those who may identify as transgender, non-binary, gender diverse, gender fluid, or who otherwise feel that their gender identity does not align with the sex assigned to them at birth and or society's expectations of gender. So I'm going to stop sharing that screen now because uh, we want to jump into some questions that we've pre-prepared for our panelists today and autistic students and more generally students with a disability can face various barriers when wanting to access supports if they identify as gender diverse and, and that's evidenced on the Suicide Response Project. And it's clear that suicide rates are higher for autistic people and LGBTQIA people. So this is why this important topic is so needed to be discussed. It follows that the intersectional needs of gender diverse autistic students may need a particular focus in an attempt to improve understanding and systemic supports. So what I'm gonna do is jump to question one. And we would like to start today's discussion by asking our panelists what advice they would like to give teachers and carers to better support gender diverse students. So we might go with Shazzy first. Um, so Shazzy, if you could share with the group um, how we can better support our gender diverse students. Thank you. Good morning. Um, so I work with a lot of gender diverse students in my um, my work as a a clinical nurse consultant and counselling psychotherapist. So I see many students come through. Um, a lot of I, li I live in WA, so a lot of the schools up here aren't prepared for this. So it's great if anyone is here from WA listening, 
that we change things. Um, change starts at the top, so the very beginning. Forms and documentation, um, when you first sign up to a school, it would be good to have all, you know, all genders have it open to look into gender inclusion, to gender diversity on those forms. Um, parent communications, uh, using people's pronouns, um, learning about pronouns. It's not up to the gender diverse individual to teach you about themselves. It's up to the allies and the teachers and the whoever's working as a carer um, to learn themselves. Uh, there's a few websites for this. I, I really enjoy Minus 18. I think that's a really good one for explaining all the term. There's a lot of terminology to learn. So even I am not aware of all the terminology and some people surprise me. So asking questions is absolutely fine, but trying to find out a bit for yourself is brilliant. <laughs> School formals are a bit of a, uh, a subject here in WA. Uh, people have been left out of school formals because they haven't been allowed to dress the way that they need to dress. Um, so that's been a bit of a topic for a lot of young people. Same with school leadership roles. Um, it's very much separation of classes. Um, sports and athletics days, that's one that's been in the media quite a lot, um, where people can be, uh, you know, either in the girls section or the boys section, you know, as a gender non-conformist, where do I go? Or, same with toilets. Um, we don't have enough schools that have universal toilets. We have girls' toilets, we have boys' toilets. Where am I supposed to go? Am I supposed to cross my legs the whole day? I don't know. Um, sex education is another place that we need to work on. <clears throat> we don't include um, diversity within sex education. I know it's a, a difficult topic. Uniforms. Uniforms really get me because I, I have two autistic children as well. Um, and our school uniforms, the sports uniforms are pretty comfortable. The everyday uniform is very tight. There's a lot of tight clothing to wear, but there's no leeway on that. They have to wear their uniform. So some leeway on the uniform for autistics because you know uniform is really difficult, but also for gender diverse people, like uh, sometimes my daughter would like to wear trousers and that's not permitted. It's, it's things like little things like that that make a huge difference to us. Um, assumptions about partners, like, you know, in the older classes, you asked about boyfriends and girlfriends a lot, and it, it might not be that way for some people. Teacher titles, having examples of um, gender diversity within the teaching community is, is paramount. It's, it's where we learn. It's, it's where we learn that we're accepted as part of the community. So, you know, having Mr. This and Mrs. That might not work for everybody. There are gender diverse teachers out there, and I, I know at least one who goes by mix and they're allowed to use that title at school. And that helps, you know, young people go up to them and say, hey, let's start a conversation about themselves. Um, subject choices uh, is one of the other things I was going to talk about. Making LGBTQ diversity visible in the school. So things like uh, We're at Purple Day, which was a, a few weeks ago. I think only one school in our area actually celebrated this and it was huge, it was brilliant. And all the school um, went with it. It was fantastic. Um, and the pictures that came up on social media were brilliant, but only one school did that and WA is pretty huge. So it's nice to see that happening. I would like to see that more. Um, where, if you don't know about Wear It Purple Day, Wear It Purple is celebrating the gender diversity of, of young people. Um, and obviously everybody wears purple, but it, you know, it's, it's something that helps people feel accepted within the community, within the school community. Same with um, uh, the you know, neurodiversity celebration days, celebrating things like that, make us feel part of the school community. Um, discriminatory language, uh, using people's dead names, it happens so much. Uh, I'm not sure about the school settings, but I've seen it in the university settings. Um, I'm a university member myself, and I've seen it in my classes that pronouns are not used correctly. Um, it, despite being very visual on your screen, um, I'm obviously a they them, but I'm, I'm called everything under the sun. I don't mind. Um, I understand when people do it um, accidentally, it's a lot to take on, especially in conversations with many people. But when people do it on purpose and spitefully, that's not cool. Um, and that's happened to me before. Um, to be available to be teachers to be available to be, to be able to support LGBTI students. Um, 
just coming to the seminar is a great start, but there's lots of learning to be done out there. The for children and young people have great training sessions on this stuff and they're, they're across um, Australia. So there's, there's learning and stuff out there that I have some, um, some stuff for different states because I know we cross a lot of states here, um, but each have their own uh, school, school kind of rules. And you, New South Wales is really open to gender communication within schools. So, and that's fantastic. But a lot of the, the other states aren't. Um, Supporting students, student-led initiatives to create change is one of the most powerful things that we can do. Um, so students that want to start, you know, a, a, a LGBTQI meeting, you know, let that happen, go with it. Um, take the pressure off as well. We, we see a lot of heteronormativity within classes. Um, it's always mummy and daddy and sometimes people might not have mummy and daddy. I work with a lot of people who have two mums or two dads and you know, that's, that's their normal and that's okay. Um, dis uh, discriminatory language, I think I've already covered that. And yeah, just using examples in class, just everyday language in class when we say like, it, you know, maths questions are set really old school. Like, if Mr. Thingy has this and Mr. Thingy has this, how many children do they have together? Kind of thing. And it's like, oh, come on. It's like, but slightly bring it into where we can all be together and be on the same page. That was really good, Shazzy. Thank you so much. And I think some of the points around modeling um, and encouraging teachers to be themselves and hopefully our community can make it safe enough for. Um, teachers to be themselves we need to that will really foster that open communication and hopefully filter down to students I know with um, my child attending previously at a Catholic school it was definitely not something open within the teacher community but now going to a community school it's so beautiful to see teachers open about their gender diversity their sexual diversity and it's just such a culture shift um, that allows students to be open about who they are and it feels safer to be that. So I really like how you've explained that as your example and so many other great examples there. I might jump now to Shadia to answer that question as well. Yeah, I think um, Shazi, you brought up some really important points regarding how to foster an inclusive environment, whether it's in primary, secondary or tertiary. I definitely relate to being misgendered. I still get misgendered even when I display my pronouns. And I think this is just down to lack of exposure. And I think we're just not used to seeing the diversity of pronouns within the wider community. Um, I was really lucky to go to a very inclusive school environment and um, there were really open conversations at, at the school assemblies about zero um, zero tolerance for bullying and being inclusive in our language and not using homophobic language um, and that sort of and that sort of thing. And there was lots of visible um, supports for LGBT students. So we were part of the Safe Schools Victoria, um, which and and we had a lot of resources provided from minus eighteen, and we also had a student panel run by um, queer teachers as well about um, LGBT related issues within the school. So there was lots of visibility and there was always someone that you could go to for support. I think little things like um, being visible in the form of like maybe having some pronouns, pins, even if you are not gender diverse yourself, I think it just normalises sharing them. Um, and I find it helpful anyway to know. Um, and I think it's just being able to have those conversations and even amongst other teachers um, because it all starts with education and if we start talking about them more, it will get out there that these uh, us as students have these diverse um, diversities. A lot of people don't even know what non-binary is when I tell them. So um, if we can sort of disseminate the knowledge throughout the community, um, I think that'd be really powerful. And also if you're in a position of leadership, looking at your school policy, are there inclusive policies that you can um, add and, and discuss with teachers um, and students and, and incorporate the student voice where possible to, to improve on those inclusive practices. Um, I think that they're the, the main things that I would 
had um, my school also got rid of uniforms, which was great because I a had sensory issues, which meant that the even the unisex options that they provided were not comfortable for me. Um, but they also let me source my own clothing that looked similar to the school uniform because they knew that I just couldn't I couldn't cope with the sensory nature of the uniforms they provided. So small things like that really make a difference. Looking back at primary school, I really hated wearing dresses. So as soon as I got to wear pants to school, it was such a great feeling. Um, and I guess when when you're sort of um, talking to students, I know that there are some strategies like you might have a get to, you know, those get to know you sheets that you have at the start of each term. You might have put down, you know, what are your pronouns? Uh, which pronouns do you want me to use around other students? You know, what, what pronouns do you want me to use around the parents? Um, that can help just start that conversation about whether the student is gender diverse and affirming them in the way that they they want to be affirmed, but also protecting their safety um, as well, which is really important. Really good, uh, Shadia. Thank you so much. So many great points. And I'm so glad you had that opportunity to attend a school like that, but also share what schools are doing right because we often hear about what they're not doing. And so by having this example shared today, hopefully we can, you know, learn from that and, and, and other schools can embrace that. And you mentioned things like visibility, and I think that was very critical. And knowing how and where to go to support is so important. And I loved your ideas of pronoun pins because of normalising that, not even for those who have um, diverse pronouns. So thank you so much. I think that's really amazing um, feedback. And... We know so many of our students may be facing exclusion or bullying, which can present a sudden mental health decline, such as anxiety or depression, school refusal. Um, and this can be, you know, come from a school environment that doesn't acknowledge their identity, their pronouns. And, you know, it's very difficult um, for them. They're going through a lot of changes generally, but to add on top of that a non-safe environment, we understand why there's so many links. Um, to poor mental health. So what I will go on to is question two, and um, this is evidence and research continues to show that certain groups of students face increased, as I was saying, factors when it comes to matters such as bullying, exclusion, risk of sexual violence, complex mental health issues such as anxiety and depression, self-harming, suicidal ideation, and death by suicide. It's just shocking and statistics show higher suicide rates for both the autistic community and the LGBTQIA plus communities. Um, so we are focusing on developing a better understanding of the specific risk factors for autistic students and gender diverse young people when it comes to navigating their gender identity and gender expression. So we're asking our panelists to share their thoughts on why being neurodivergent makes our young people more vulnerable. It is a big question, very important one. We might jump to you, Shazi, um, and I know you're keen to share some of your thoughts on this one. So, it's really important, and research is proving this, that when gender diverse young people are fully supported, they have similar health outcomes to their cisgender peers. That, that is a fact. Parental support plays a key role, but the, um, the emergent evidence is that the, uh, having a safe, supportive school is critical to a young person um, in that circumstance. So school safety and connectedness, um, for example, the protective factors against depression, self-harm and suicide, this is so important. Um, it's, we're, at, we're at school. People at school uh, for a lot of their day, a lot of their life. Um, so the majority of their, their day is, is spent in that school environment. And if that environment is not a positive one for them, you can only imagine the effect it has on their mental health. <laughs> so policies and procedures um, that enable a young person, their, their pronouns, I think Shadi already said this, to be uh, accurately recorded is important. Research shows that having an identity docu of documents that match their firm gender, is associated with lower rates of serious psychological distress and suicidal thought and planning. So that is something really simple we can do that would change the course of somebody's life. Um, the media has a, has a lot to say about this and it's better 
to have um, positive exposure to media. Uh, there's lots of negative media about this, this group of people that um, we're exposed to every day. So having that positive exposure is really important. Just a few statistics for you, because I like statistics, I'm autistic like that. So Telethon Institute here in WA, uh, they did a study and found that 89% of young people, um, gender diverse young people had experienced peer rejection. 74% uh, had experienced bullying and 69% had experienced discrimination. That's really high percentages and we really wanna get those down. Latrobe did another study that found 68% of, of uh, gender diverse young people in Australia had felt uncomfortable and unsafe in their educational setting because of their gender or sexuality diversity. Uh, the LGBTQ Health Australia stats say that a third of young people, uh, young gender diverse Australians were four times more likely to have experienced sexual violence or coercion. So there's some really important stats there. The stats with um, suicide, uh, suicide um, attempts. So LGBTQ people aged 16 to 17 are five times more likely to attempt suicide. Transgender people 14 to 25 are 15 times more likely to attempt suicide. And overall, 48.1% of transgender diverse people um, have attempted suicide at one time in their life. So we're gonna come across this. Um, having a, a school counselor who is gender aware or even gender diverse themselves would be really helpful. I think, as well from the autistic side of it, having a safe space that a person, young person can go to, because bullying happens everywhere. We, you know, you can't keep an eye on it. You can't um, stop it. Sometimes it happens. It would be great if it didn't happen, but it, it it's a it's a fact of life at the moment. Um, even though a lot of schools have zero tolerance on bullying, it, it can happen. So having a safe space for people to go to um, during those times of stress, like break times are very stressful. There's a lot of noise in, in the playgrounds and the recreation areas. Um, having a quiet, sense, even sensory room would be awesome to go to, just to bring the levels of stress down a lot. Um, and again, celebrating and advocating diversity. Um, that would take the risk factors right down. Oh, yeah, absolutely, Shazzy. It's, it's heartbreaking statistics, but everyone needs to hear it because it's real. and. You know, these strategies might save lives. So it's so important. Um, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I know a lot of some comments in the in the chat talking about bullying and exclusion and, you know, that extra layer of vulnerability around the, the intersectional issues is there. So thank you. Um, Shadia, what's your comments on developing a better understanding of these risk factors? Yeah. Um... I, just from my personal point of view, I found it very isolating when I was younger. I didn't have many friends. Um, and as an adult, I don't, I've grown to accept that within myself and know that I don't need many friends in order to feel fulfilled in my life. But as a teenager, I remember really, really wanting to make friends. And unfortunately, this meant that I, um, I missed a lot of the red flags that others might pick up on in friendships and put trust in people that really didn't um, respect me as a person. Um, and that was really challenging to navigate. Um, and I think that that's something that's quite common in both communities, but particularly being gender diverse and me not knowing at the time that I was, um, I think that that definitely affected the way I related to people. I remember not really relating to my peers, not really feeling comfortable with either label of girl or boy, not knowing really why I felt that way. Um, and then I remember starting to mask a lot to try and figure out where I fit in in the community. And um, I can really credit my school for being so open and about difference that I found so many like-minded people that strayed me off that path. And I remember one day I was really upset and I just said to my friend, uh, why is auti being autistic so hard? And he said, no, there's nothing wrong with you. You know, be being autistic, it gives you all these strengths. And I remember that just shifted my thinking that day. And if it wasn't for that friend, I, I would have been in probably in a very diff different place. Um, so it definitely makes a huge difference having that school community, being able to 
find peers with like-minded interests, having um, activity-based groups um, during lunchtime even, like we had art group, music group, um, gaming group. We had all sorts of activities to choose from. And as I said, we also had that leadership group that was specific to the queer community so we could discuss those um, issues within the school in depth and run by queer teachers. And I think having those teachers that were feeling comfortable about being open also really helped us as students. Um, and I think that's great for teachers as well to have that space to feel safe as well. Um, so I guess it's really important that you are aware of with young people that um, uh, because of the social isolation that we can experience that, and I, I guess from my point of view, I'm a very trusting person that can unfortunately lead to us not seeing the red flags or even knowing what green flags in a friendship can look like. Um, so I think being able to identify outlets where you can um, facilitate positive friendships and having those open discussions about, you know, what, why do you feel this way? And, um, you know, being able to have those open conversations, uh, I think at also teachers, um, my teachers were huge supports in that and helping me through that time where I was unfortunately going through a really difficult friendship um, that really helped me with my own mental health and being able to know that I wasn't alone. Um, so yeah, that would be my main points. And I think just being aware that, um, I, I guess I was very interested in going to events like the minus 18 um, formals and things, but being autistic, I really found it difficult with large numbers of people. Um, I think it's really important that we start to look at this intersection and start providing um, safe spaces for both queer and autistic people to access these spaces because um, I found that really challenging when I was younger I wanted to go and do these activities and I wanted to go connect with like-minded peers but it just didn't seem accessible to me at the time um, and likewise going to autistic specific spaces and being misgendered and not understood um, that also affected me as well so um, I've been I've had the pleasure of working with um, trans and gender diverse young people. We've had a few specific groups for those, um, those our community, and it's just been fantastic seeing us all connect and um, having role models for me to look up to as well that are part of the queer community have been really important. So Hannah Gadsby, Clem Barstow, um, Hannah Busnett, they're just some examples of some of the role models within our community that um, yeah. have helped lead the way for people like myself. <laughs> and and you too now and Shazzy, people who are listening at home and those who might be tuning in with their younger person, you're not alone even though you might be in a remote part of Australia or even around the world and feel so disconnected from this intersection. It, you know, there are people out there so brave to share their specific stories and Thank you for those, those comments. Very, very valuable information. And pride seems to be a massive protective factor for both the autistic and the LGBTQIA plus communities. Um, but obviously there are those vulnerabilities around not knowing, generally as an autistic individual, not knowing how to sometimes identify those red flags or like you said, those green flags puts, puts our community at greater risk and um, finding that connection in a safe way is truly important so thank you for for bringing that up um, so much very very important um, so we're going to jump to our next question and it's question three and we want to take some time to look at effective protective measures I did just mention one being pride that we can suggest to schools teachers parents and allies to support students and what are your thoughts on how schools can implement meaningful and inclusive support. So now we've touched on it a bit, um, maybe a, a practical example to help reduce associated isolation and bullying and the stigma for our cohort of students and to ensure, and this is a mouthful, that it's delivered consistently across the school. It's a bit of a mouthful, but I am going to jump to Shazzy first because we did just hear from you, Shadi, if that's all right. Shazzy. What yes, sure. So again, like, Celebrating work, things like Wear It Purple Day and New Diversity Celebration Day um, as a whole school. Um, I, see, I see other things being celebrated. I see World Cancer Awareness Day coming up. I see Are You OK Day coming up, but I don't see the rest of the stuff being celebrated in the same way. Um, have, like I said, having that quiet uh, areas to go to to be safe 
um, within the school premises. Um, having someone safe to go to. Um, I know a lot of places don't have school counsellors, but school counsellors or somebody in that kind of role um, would be really helpful. Um, <laughs> protective measures. It's, it's, it, I think we've covered literally everything from the connectedness, this, this school safety, the um, being available to support students and having the knowledge base behind that to be able to support students. And knowing when you're doing too much, sometimes teachers might be over questioning students and to know when to stop, to say like, if somebody says, like, I don't want to talk about it, then leave it at that and let them come to you rather than you go to them and say, look, hey, I see you're wearing this today. Are you gender diverse? Are you this? Do you need this? Um, it's the same with asking questions to trans students, like asking questions about um, their medications or, or their chemicals or their bodies. It's not OK. Um, if they want to talk about it, that's up to them. But asking questions on it, not, it's not cool. Um, it's actually uh, counterproductive. So, yeah. So yeah. Agree, and we had someone in the comments saying that their child has said that respecting pronouns is the absolute one of the biggest protective measures. Um, and that's from a, a young autistic person. So thank you for sharing that in the comments. Um, Shadia, do you want to add some thought to that? I know we've covered a lot, but anything else that you'd like to add, we'd love to hear from you. I think um, it's kind of similar in a way. Well, I see a lot of parallels being part of both communities. The whole issue with, for example, employment of neurodivergent people. Um, there's been a lot of pressure placed on um, autistic people to disclose their autism at the workplace. But how about we think about the workplace and how inclusive their policies are and are they actively looking to recruit a diverse workforce? Likewise, is your school um, policy set up to encourage neuroqueer staff to um, be employed there? Because I think the more that we, we, we are actively looking to include diversity, the more that these issues, I think, will be addressed. Um, as I said, it, it, you know, similarly, it's often on us as students to reach out to teachers for support, but I went to a school where you could literally see it in every corridor that there was support available. So it took the pressure off of me of thinking, oh, where am I going to go for support if I need it? There was there were teachers, there were school counsellors. We had two school counsellors, I think, um, psychologists as well. So I knew that I was going to be supported there if I, once I started questioning. Um, I think being able to have um, public speaking opportunities for students as well as the staff would be really great because I know that there are a lot of students who are probably well-meaning but may not be exposed to the queer community. Um, I know a lot of my peers, um, they haven't even heard of things like non-binary, gender diverse. And I think if we start educating young people and destigmatizing what being queer is about, that will, I think, have a huge impact on the overall community as well. Um, and, uh, and of course, being able to consult with, with members of the queer and autistic community when, as I said, looking at policy or um, looking at bullying procedures and um, even providing connection points for students in terms of other mentoring opportunities or their leadership opportunities. Um, I think that that's a good start to be able to, yeah, change the environment, not the person. <laughs> Absolutely. It needs to be a culture shift as well. And we see you all at the grassroots level as teachers who are trying to shift that, even by changing today. And the frustration, there must be red tape, there must be systems that need to be changed. It is difficult and we know you've got a lack of time and resources and you might be only one person, but by modelling and shifting and starting this conversation, you will begin that ripple effect and it will, it will, it will come. So thank you for being the pioneers in your schools or at home even with your family. You might be the first one in the family to have someone that's gender diverse that you want to, you know, openly discuss pronouns with a family that might be quite traditional and closed off from it. So thank you so much for being part of the solution. Um, great comments, Shadia. Very important protective measures. Just going to check, are we going to questions now? We might go to questions because there's a few in there. Um, so let's have this question here. Um, 
we've got to support my 16 year old transgender son I introduce him as my son and use his preferred he him pronouns even though he dresses as a male he's he does still look very feminine and we will get treated and looked as if we are strange is this the right way that I should introduce him my son says I can just say this is my child which doesn't feel as loving to me I'm proud to call him my son should I just ignore the stares and comments it is so hard to see the sadness on his face when someone says to us, we are together. Hello, ladies. Ugh. Okay, let's answer that one. Who wants to go first? I can Nadia. go first. Are you fine with that, Chazzy? Yeah. Um, I think firstly, um, yes, language is tricky. I've had a lot of discussions with my own mother about this because she's a teacher as well. Um, I think um this whole idea when you look back at the gender bred person gender identity and expression are very separate things unfortunately i think our community has quite a long way to go in understanding that and i can definitely relate to being misgendered based on the fact that i still present as very feminine but for me my experience of gender is more of an internal experience and i just don't understand the boxes why people put other people in boxes I just see clothes as clothes I see makeup as anyone can wear it um so I guess it's again being able to have those open discussions with people and being able to um have a discussion with your child and see you know is this is this how you're happy for me to refer to you um if I'm asked these questions does this sound okay and really make it a collaborative process of disclosure um, that's the discussion I had with my own parent um, because she was unsure whether it was okay to disclose um, in conversations. But something that we came up with is uh, my child is non-binary. This is why they use they, them pronouns um, and maybe even providing a resource if they're wanting to learn more. Like the Minus 18 website has a lot of definitions as well. Um, but I think, yeah, it, it's really, really challenging when um, there's still these sort of stereotypes around gender diverse people. Um, but I think being able to say, you know, my, this, is, this is what my son prefers or child prefers. Um, and also realizing that the responses of other people and their attitudes, you cannot unfortunately directly control. You can advocate for your child, but at some point they're going to have to make a shift themselves. So I think for your own mental health, it's also important to realise that because I understand it can be really upsetting when this happens. Um, and you can assert yourself and say, these are my pronouns and I, I really love it if you could respect those. But if a person decides not to, that's on them, not you. And you then have to decide, is this a safe space for me? And should I walk away? Do I have uh, further supports in place? Um, so for example, for me, sometimes I just have a have a you know complaint to my gender diverse friends going, oh yeah, I was misgendered three times today. And you know, but I think it's important not to always feel the burden on yourself as an uh, as an ally as well as a gender diverse person to constantly be educating people because it, it does take its toll. Thanks, such a great response, Shadia. Taking notes on all those answers, really good. And thank you for the question. We're gonna to go to Shazzy, but thank you to the parent for being so respectful and an amazing ally. So well done um, to you here. <laughs> yeah. I was uh, gonna say the same thing. I'm so proud of that parent. I oh, didn't yeah. catch that who they were, but that is amazing that you're so um, protective over your son and that you're so um, wanting to do the right thing. I think it's up to them what, what they want. So follow your son's lead and let them be the leader. But also remember that what other people think of you is none of it, none of your business. It's none of your business. So there are so many differences between us, whether you're you, how you look or like I'm a wheelchair user, so I go out in a wheelchair often, I get a lot of looks. It's none of my business what those people think about me. So as long as you're okay with inside yourself and you're okay with your son, I think you're doing all the right things. Yeah, really good point, Shazzy, and also recognising that even within families, there's a lot of cultural and intersectional um, sort of shit, really big shit. That we... Oh, sorry, we're just getting a little audio from somewhere. Hold on, can, can, if anyone's got themselves off mute, can you please pop yourself on mute? 
I think um, just coming from a speech pathology perspective too, um, there is a lot of discussion now within the community on um, speech pathology for gender diverse individuals. And uh, I did a course on it through La Trobe. They've got a really good program that's actually run by gender diverse speech pathologists. And part of it is also knowing about how to assert yourself and your needs and being able to come from it from a holistic perspective rather than the medical model of gender diversity that's often explored. So I, I just want to put that out there that that could be something to explore for your child. Um, David Azzel's done a lot of work in this space in Australia. Um, so And I can't remember the name, I think MC Goldberg. It, it is a huge movement anyway, and there's quite a few autistic queer speech pathologists also starting to talk about these issues. So definitely exciting times. I'm hoping to be a part of that movement too. Thank you so much, Shadia. And in the comments, Sorry, I just, just just to let you know, I put in the comments a link for parents of gender diverse, diverse children too, because okay. that's a good great. one. Thank you. And, and speaking of the comments, we've got two great comments from some of our attendees. And one has said with lots of conversations around the people who matter and the people who don't, this determines our level of conversation, advocacy and anger. We also check in regularly from when we need to step in our 10-year-old non-binary autistic child who is very vocal. So that's that's a great answer. And another one um, saying, my 12-year-old kiddo asked me to introduce them and correct people calmly each time. And for them, as a non-binary person, they, they want me, who is there all the time, to be telling people and not asking them. So that's, again, another approach. And it's really nice to see that we're being led by our children as well. So we do have another question that's come up. I'm not sure if you can see that on screen. I will read it out if it's not come up. I found that the zero tolerance for bullying policies at schools are often horribly black and white and fail to address the need to understand the nuances of interreactions and genuinely support change. How can we nuance these policies so schools don't feel the need to lie and say they don't have bullying and instead work with young people to change inappropriate behaviours? I've seen this done really well in one school. So obviously there's hope. Um, who wants to jump in on that one? Shadia, I'm just gonna throw you a okay. question. Um, I definitely agree from what I've heard um, that yes, you can have a policy, but implementing it is another thing. Again, I was very lucky to go to a school where if we had bullying issues, there was a proper discussion put in place. I think when you make a policy, you have to have follow-ups that need to be implemented. So whether that's education for the students, maybe having a discussion with them, um, uh, whether it's a sort of, as I said, having a public speaker come in and talk about their experiences, um, thinking about how you can protect the person who's been bullied, because we know that unfortunately, if it's not addressed, it can happen again. So um, are there supports put in place um, to, to be able to check in on them and make sure they're okay? Um, you know, uh, I guess I think another issue that I often experience uh, and still remember in primary school is this whole feeling of being dop a dopper um, when going and telling a teacher that there was something happening. So um, how do we address that? Because we might be able to go and disclose to teachers that we're being bullied, but then the after effect is then being ostracised and being told that you're a dopper. So that might then reduce your likelihood of being able to reach out for support again. So how can we um, have a conversation with the entire school community on what, what to do when you are being bullied and um, protect these students? Because I, I feel like we don't do that enough for our young people. Um, and it really breaks my heart hearing that some of the stories of students being repeatedly bullied. So I would have some key strategies put in place straight away. Um, and once you know that a student's being bullied, I think it's really important to Follow through, and unfortunately, that can really depend on a the teacher involved and also the individual school. And um, if you notice that there are policies that are not being implemented, that's um, there are key teachers that can then advocate in that space. Um, but obviously, I understand that as teachers, it can be challenging too. But um, yeah, that that would be my thought. Shazzy might have some um, more ideas on strategies. <laughs> yeah, Shazzy, over to you. Thanks, Viv. Um, schools not only have an ethical um, duty, but a legal obligation to provide a safe space for their students. And so that should already be in part of their human rights policy. 
Um, and Ema writes, the uh, commission covers uh, LGBTQ community and people with disabilities. Autistics, unfortunately, come under people with disabilities. Um, I can argue that one all day, but, you know, we do, we are kind of disabled by society and by societal expectations of us. So ADHDers don't really have that yet in Australia. It, ADHD doesn't come under disabilities in Australia, although it does in America. So we're guessing we're getting there on the policy side of things individually. Um, like sh sh like um, Shadiga said, <laughs> do my glasses off so I can't see anything. They annoy me. Um, like Shadia said, putting the policies in uh, is great. It's ha great having a policy there, but they've got to be put into action. And it's got to be a whole school um, decision and um, implementation. So there needs to be training in there. It's great having a policy on gender diversity, but if, if teachers don't understand gender diversity, what's, yeah. how can you follow through on a policy like that? Oh, it's great yeah. having a policy on neurodiversity, but if teachers don't understand the basic concepts of neurodiversity and the neurodivergent language, what's the point of having a policy on this? So having a whole school um, attitude on it, there's great things coming from the top, from the, the commissioners, um, from the schools of education. There's fantastic stuff on the websites for most of the states, not all the states, but there's statewide policies on all of these things. Um, it's up to the individual schools to go to those websites and look at those policies and bring it into their schools. Yeah, thank you, Shadi. Um, Shazi, sorry, thank you, Shazi and Shadia. Great answers. Everyone's loving it in the comments. Really good information. And I think generally schools as a whole don't often do well with um, covert bullying. They're so it's so hidden, and as the question indicated, nuanced. And it's the exclusion many of us face as being generally in term, neurodivergent to begin with, and then you add the, the, the other intersection of difference that I can see why there's such an issue around this. Um, so thank you for bringing this up. Uh, we've got a time for a couple more questions and there's a few good ones. Um, maybe just keeping these answers a bit short just so we can get to them. We had a question from a family saying, how do we manage um, the challenge of having a supportive family around pronouns and gender diversity, but then obviously dealing with younger siblings who don't quite get it. How do we uh, support that family with that? Maybe go to you, Shazzy, and we'll jump to another question for you. I, um, I think Shari. it depends on how the age of the child, but you can start these conversations really early. Um, you know, just by modelling through play, I play with my children. I mean, there's the LGBTQ Lego, which I love, but there's, um, you know, you can you can model through play. You know, uh, we, we often play with dolls and say, this boy is going to marry this girl and off they go. But we can model different ways of thing. I get, and sometimes I say to my children, hang on a second. What, what if he wants to marry that boy there? <laughs> what if he, what do you want to do? You know, what if he doesn't want to get married? What if they want to have children? Like, then we have these conversations as part of play. And then I think that's where children learn as part of play. Yep. And as a follow on question, um, I'm going to ask Shadia. Someone's asked how they manage the challenge of a young non binary child in primary school age. They're nine years old and their child is in. Um, it's a new frontier for the primary school addressing gender issues whilst so young. And I guess we are seeing that and um, across primary schools, not previously having to, you know, address these topics, but it's great that we're having these conversations earlier. So Shadia, do you have any suggestions for that question? Firstly, I'm so happy to hear that there are younger people feeling comfortable and to be able to explore their gender and and yeah, I think that's great. Um, I think, again, it just comes back to what Chazzy was saying about language. I think, you know, model language and inclusive language. So, I mean, even when you look um, in allied health with a lot of the assessment and therapy materials, you see a lot of gendered language. So, you know, girl, boy, his, her, model different pronouns and model different structures. I think, um, I think it, yeah, I think education starts young um, and we are now slowly starting to see TV shows and um, popular kids um, media starting to, to um, recognise this. Um, but I think it just comes down to, again, being able to just explain 
you know, why to say, you know, we all have our different pronouns. This is how they want to refer to themselves. But I think I remember back to primary school, there was no discussion on they, them pronouns. There was no discussion on, um, you know, uh, dad, two dads, two mums, you know, all that sort of thing. There was just no discussion. And I think um, no wonder I didn't know about myself because I was never exposed to it. So I think it just comes comes down to being able to explain and then, you know, being able to advocate for that student if there are issues within the classroom and, and being able to also have a discussion about the student about the fact that there, there will be people in the future, sadly, who won't affirm their pronouns and what to do in those situations, because that can be really confronting. Um, and I think that that's also an important discussion to have um, and know when to step back and step away and um, protect your own mental health. I hope that that, that really helps. is really great. And look, we are sort of getting too close to the end, but um, there is one point that I wanted to cover off with you both. And that is, um, you know, as autistic individuals, we can go deep diving into research and, and learning about it. And que we question ourselves a lot. And it and also there is sometimes people with rigidity in their thinking. And one of the questions was, um, there's this pressure for my young person to know who they are in terms of their gender diversity. And I wonder if there's a way we can encourage them to understand that it could be fluid and change over time and that's okay. They don't need to have the pressure of knowing exactly who they are. Do, does anyone want to speak to that fluidity and the rigidity and that sort of intersection of, of gender and autistic identity? I think it's difficult to know who you are at any age, um, particularly, you know, when you're growing up, it's it's very it's very fluid uh, of who you are. Um, but a lot of schools, I'm acknowledging the previous question. I've put a few things in the in the in the chat there for them, but a few schools are like, well, they're too young to know who they are, and yet when you see people um, my age, they knew who they were at the age of five. They knew who they were at the age of six. You know, that we, we know who we are. We're just not allowed to express that. And that um, opp oppression, in a way, that leads to more um, poorer mental health outcomes, shall we say. So having that ability to express ourselves as we are in that moment is really important. So whether that my little boy, um, and he's a little boy, he used to dress up in pink clothing. He loved it. Um, he loved his pink dresses. But as soon as he got to school, it was like, well, boys wear blue, girls wear pink. I never taught them that, ever. And actually, historically, it used to be the other way around. But we won't go into that autistic nugget. Um, so, you know, just encourage them where they're at and, you know, let them express themselves where they're at and meet them where they're at, at whatever stage they're at. Uh, yes, sorry, I was like, yes, yes, Jazzy, yes. And I and I think this is interesting about the diversity of autistic individuals that, yes, many of us and every, in the community do know who we are, but there's also many who don't because they've masked or they've, you know, they've taken on others' personalities. And it is such a fluid thing that we have to encourage that you've got time to work out mm. who you are, but we will respect that journey as well, whatever it may be. Sharia. Mm. Well, I'm coming from the perspective of not figuring it out properly until I was 16. So um, that was quite interesting because my friends had worked it out before I had because they were also neuroqueer and they said, I don't think you're cis and I don't think you're straight. And I went, but I just hadn't, to be honest, it was not on my priority list to figure out when I was younger. I had other things that on my mind. Um, it kind of didn't register as something important to me at that stage. And I think that that's fine. It just took me longer. And um, I do not relate to stories of people who knew from a toddler, but that's not to say that either experience is invalid. It's just different. But I know that they, they were the stories I heard about growing up. And so I thought, that can't be me. I haven't known and I've never felt that way until quite recently and then it was only when I started to speak to my friends that they went yeah that's normal it's okay to go through stages where you think you might be this and then decide that there's some there's another identity that you resonate more with and and I've definitely had that journey and yes it's been extremely confronting for me because I've wanted to put myself into a box and go is this how I am like can I just figure it out 
And I've realized it's not, it's a journey. It's not a, you can't put into a box your experiences as a human being. And I've decided to start to embrace that and be able to accept the ambiguity within myself and actually see that as beautiful, that there are no rules in order to be a valid human being. And I think that that was really important for me to learn from the queer community that there's no need to prove yourself to anyone. You are who you are and that's valid enough, even if that means you're questioning or your gender expression and identity change over time. So I think, again, it goes by say, having role models in your community and having these discussions early on. And having parents go, you know what, if your pronouns change, I, I will try and affirm you. Um, I will always affirm you. Um, that that means a lot. <laughs> that is so well said, Shadia. And actually, we did go to our community and we're wrapping up, but there's a quote here that speaks to this particular point. Being autistic and a self-confessed rigid thinker and someone who craved predictability and concrete answers, I found it really hard to explain except the fluid journey I was about to go through in my teens. And as I questioned and explored my gender and sexuality, I wish I had more support during this stage and told there was no pressure to be any one thing and that sexuality and gender could be fluid and may change over time. So I think that actually was a nice ending to um, that particular question. And also just to finish up on a quote um, from an autistic uh, queer teacher, they speak openly about their wife and autistic identity as part of the general conversation to normalise it and they honour their chosen pronouns and name. And I think we'll leave that up there on screen, but I guess the point is it definitely um, speaks to what we've talked about in terms of making it a safe place for our entire school community, including teachers, to be themselves, um, to model and have that opportunity that um, students can then you know, have that conversation in a safe way. And thank you to everyone listening at home, being here, being part of the conversation. Thank you to all our um, neuro queer community, but also our allies that are tuning in. A massive thank you to Shazzy and Shadia for today. Honestly, so many great bits of information. Um, thank you from the bottom of our heart at Yellow Ladybugs. We always want to be uh, leading this conversation and, and this intersection is so important to discuss. Thank you at home in the comments. Oh, it's been wonderful to see. And thanks to the young people who might be listening. You're not alone. I hope these amazing role models today show you that. And um, we're sending you all our love and protection from Yellow Ladybugs. Thank you. And yes, sending all our love. Thanks, Shazzy. Thanks, Shadia. And we'll, um, yes, thank you. The recording will be available to watch back because there were so many good tidbits in here. And thank you um, as well for everyone joining today. Bye. Bye.